Uh, thank you very much. And to all the nominees, I appreciate your willingness to step forward and serve your country at an important time in some really important roles. Uh, Lieutenant General Dayton is a star. And um, Mr. Chairman, I think you know how I feel about him. I think he's uh, the right person at the right time. Um, he has a distinguished military career. And since he hung up his uniform, he's continued to serve as director of the German Marshall Center. And he's used that post effectively, in my view, to increase uh, democracy development in Europe and especially in Ukraine. And he's held, by the way, a number of seminars for members of the Ukrainian military and the RADA. Uh, my own staff uh, at the Permanent Subcommittee Investigations has assisted with teaching some of those classes. That's when I first came to know General Dayton. And uh, I believe he's knowledgeable, passionate about the issues, as we've seen today, and has worked hard to make the Ukrainian military a more capable and credible force. And and one that does help fight corruption, that does have civilian control. Um, and that's, that's, that's a big accomplishment that uh, I think uh, he, he is largely responsible for. He's got instant credibility in Ukraine, and we need somebody who can hit the ground running right now. So he's got my support, and I hope my colleagues uh, will support him and, and continue to work with him. Um, we've got real threats right now in Ukraine, obviously. Uh, Russia continues to be aggressive on the border, the eastern border. The devastating impact of COVID-19 pandemic on, on all countries is, is also visited Ukraine, unfortunately, and we need a confirmed ambassador there badly. So as I have said before, I think Ukraine is a critical strategic partner in the United States. They've come to us, you know, they've turned to the West and uh, we wanna help them to build a more free, open and democratic society. And I think uh, although they've made strides, they're at a critical point again right now. And I think uh, General Dayton, you're the right person to help them continue on that path. I do have a letter I'd like to enter into the record by unanimous consent, uh, which is written by the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America regarding General Dayton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've already sent that electronically to your staff. Yeah, that'll be, that will be introduced into the record. General, you talked uh, briefly about the NDAA, and as you know, we have a requirement there for a, defined, uh, a, a combined uh, Department of Defense and Department of State um, capabilities report on gaps in the Ukrainian military and development of a multi-year strategy to address those issues. I think this report's important because it'll pinpoint the equipment and resources that Ukraine needs to push back against the continued Russian aggression in the Donbass and Crimea. And frankly, since we started assisting Ukraine in FY 2016 budgets, um, I've been encouraged um, by some of the progress we've made, but I've been uh, discouraged that we haven't had this type of report for Ukraine to be able to put it all together. By the way, I also support the legislation strongly that uh, Chairman Rich and Senator Menendez have led uh, with me and Senator Murphy, and I believe others now, um, which should be an, an authorization bill. And Senator Menendez talked about that earlier. But with regard to the NDAA report, could you comment on that, uh, General Dayton? Do you believe that that report is appropriate? Do you believe it would be helpful? Sorry, Senator, I had a problem with my computer for a second. I think it's very important, and it is a great opportunity for us to get Ukraine to finish focusing on mapping out requirements and priorities with our help. We've been advocating a capabilities-based midterm planning effort for the Ukrainians for the last at least two to three years. They have a new defense minister. He's taking a very deliberate approach to this problem. And what you have asked for in the NDAA is exactly the tool that I would have wanted uh, to help them get to where they need to be. I think this is this is very important, and I look forward to reading uh, both the chairman, Senator Menendez's uh, bill as well, which unfortunately I have not yet seen. Great. Well, thank you. The, the Ukraine Security Partnership Act is is what it's called, and it's it's I think it's good because it standardizes the amount of security assistance that we'd have in a multi-year strategy. Uh, and I think that's important for long-term planning. I think you would agree uh, in dealing with the Ukrainian military, that's something that would be helpful to them. Uh, one thing I will tell you in response to our legislation, uh, we had a uh, member of the, uh, um, the Russian uh, State Duma Committee, the, the chairman actually say that uh, Russia may now officially start supplying arms to the Donbass separatists. Um, I thought that was kind of ironic since uh, it seems to me it's pretty clear they've been doing that. But can you comment on that? Yeah, I saw this comment by uh, Mr. Kalashnikov, and I I'll tell you, it's really rich. Uh, you know, look, the Russians have about 2,300 people 
in the eastern provinces of Ukraine currently. They've given them more than 400 tanks, 700 field artillery pieces, mortars, drones, air defense artillery, small arms, crew-served weapons. Uh, this is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah sure, uh, as if they're not involved. You know, before the, uh, the conflict started, these people had nothing, and the Ukrainian military had it all. And right now, this is a pretty formidable force that's facing Ukrainian military, and they are indeed led and accompanied by Russian active duty troops. Well, thank you for that. You know, having visited the contact line, as you know, I've been out there. Um, it's a hot war, and uh, and there are Ukrainians who are uh, dying uh, to defending their country, and and therefore I'm pleased to see that again the NDA not only has that report, but also we provide through that the the largest uh, amount of lethal defensive aid uh, the United States has, has yet provided. So I appreciate you and my colleagues uh, on this committee in a bipartisan way supporting that. Um, Mr. Burrier, can I ask you a quick question? First of all, I do think you're uniquely qualified uh, for this position, having worked to help transition OPIC into the DFC. Uh, my question to you has to do with what should the DFC be doing going forward? Uh, it's recently come into the spotlight because in order to help bring back domestic manufacturing capability in response to COVID-19, the president invoked the Defense Production Act to uh, delegate loan authority under sections 302 and 303 of the act to the CEO of the DFC. This will allow the DFC to make loans targeted at reshoring domestic supply chain manufacturing of PPE, something we all want to see. Uh, uh, but because the DFC works now exclusively internationally, it seems a, a surprising move. And I understand the DFC has a lot of experience going into emerging markets and managing large investments. Uh, that said, I'm interested in your opinion as to why the DFC was chosen for this mission over other agencies that do operate in the United States with similar authorities. Sure. No, thank you, Senator, very much for, for the question. As you noted, there, the president side, signed an executive order in May that married DFC's financing skills with the DPA lending authority um, with a focus on COVID-19 recovery and, and relevant domestic supply change, which we all want to see bolstered. Um, I think it's a sign of the unprecedented time that we're in that, we, that the president took such a step. Um, it's a time-limited two-year authority. Um, I feel very comforted by the fact and want to share with the committee that we have done a lot of work with DOD to wall that off so that these Defense Production Act loans are done under that authority, under DOD resources, and don't impact the resources of DFC's core international mission. So our $60 billion for DFC is reserved for the international development mission. Our appropriations are reserved for our staff and the, the DPA loans will be done under the DOD resources. Um, as regards to my role, if confirmed, uh, as you pointed out, that executive order is placed that authority into the CEO. I've been nominated to be the deputy CEO. My background's in foreign policy and, and, and development. And so if confirmed, uh, the CEO has asked me to make sure that my focus is gonna be on the international mission to ensure that, that we are, are laser focused on that because the, the challenges in the developing world are just coming at us so hard that um, we're not gonna take our eye off that ball. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm sure the chairman and others do as well as a original co-sponsor of the Build Act and someone who supported the DFC enterprise, you know, changing our approach and, and consolidating and trying to be able to compete with China and others. Uh, we don't want you to be taken away from your statutory mission to invest abroad. So I, I appreciate that commitment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.